Okay, so um, today we're making a dash for the finish line. Um, we are on Nun Omid Bays. Um, let's see how many lines. Um, uh, approximately, I would say maybe 15 or so lines from the bottom, maybe a little bit more. It starts at the towards the end of the line, Omar Rava. Omar excuse Rava. me, Rabbi, excuse me. Can can I add some your site names? I forgot to. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, let's go. Uh, we have in our family four people on the same your site, which is today. Wow. Uh, yeah. Elchanan Bat Ben Yaakov Yitzchak. Elchanan Ben Yaakov Yitzchak. Um, Malka Bas Yaakov Yitzchak. Malka Bas Yaakov Yitzchak. And uh, Yocheved Bas Elchanan. Yocheved Bas Elchanan. Oh, so that's three, right? Okay, thank you. The neshamas from Amalia today, should take a learn for the neshamas from the neshamas of all of Klal Yisrael. That should be Yeshua. Amen. Okay. Can you repeat the uh, daf again, page again? Yeah, we're we're on Nun Amid Beis, Nun Amid Beis, um, and it's I would say roughly about fifteen, sixteen or so lines from the bottom. Uh, the last three words are Omar Rava Hilchasa, Omar Rava Hilchasa. So we've been talking now for, for several weeks about uh, Ona, which is uh, price fraud, Stus, which is a sixth, um, uh, or, or, or Shlish, which is a third, Machlekes in the Mishnah between uh, the Rabbanon and Rab Tarfin, whether or not a sixth is the sort of litmus test for fraud or a third. And it, it got fairly complicated here over the last week or two in understanding all the permutations and combinations of what can happen. But we're, we're sort of emerging from that, so we'll just summarize, because Rav is now going to tell us the halacha. Rav is going to give us the definitive halacha, so um, when, we, when we look back at the last few weeks, it'll become maybe a little bit clearer, because we've been talking about the future. In the last few weeks, we've been talking about the future, which is now. The future is now. So we're going to now learn the future. Okay, so basically, um, we've come to the conclusion that in the Machlekes between Rab Tarfin and the Chachamim, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Rabbanans say that Shtus is the litmus test for fraud. So less than Shtus is, is, is Mechila. We went through what is Mechila, whether well, Mechila means right away, or whether Mechili means after the opportunity to consult with a with a friend or a relative. That was one discussion. Shtus itself, according to our Mishnah, is exactly one-sixth. When the fraud is one-sixth, then the person defrauded has an option, according to the Mishnah, of either um, being reimbursed and keeping the deal or canceling the deal. But only the defrauded person can cancel the deal. The the, the, the non-fraud person, the person who actually committed the fraud, has no say in the matter. And then if it's a shtus of more than a sixth, more than uh, one-sixth of the price, then it's open to either party to cancel. They don't have to cancel, but both parties have absolute right to cancel. And then the question will be, you know, what's the economic circumstance? They'll only cancel if, if it makes sense, obviously, but they're given the opportunity to cancel and that's the Iker Chiddush. That's according to our Mishnah. But I remember we made the point that our Mishnah does not follow the exact halacha, which we're going to talk about right now. Why? Because we said that the halacha says that with an exact shtus, you can't cancel, you can only re re reimburse. The Mishnah says you can do both, but that's not what the halacha is. So there is a, a sort of a nuanced position there between the Mishnah and what is actually the, uh, the the halacha of this. So that's kind of the overall picture of where we are. And then we also talked about uh, the difference between, between whether or not you're a seller or a buyer, because we said that the whole Indian here, and again, this is all today's Gemara, but we had referenced all of this in advance. So now it'll come to pass that the discussion of whether or not the same rules apply to a buyer being defrauded or a seller being defrauded. So rather than my repeating it, let's just go into the Gemara and we're going to see exactly what the Gemara says. Um, and Rava now becomes the, the um, definitive source for the halacha. So let's start. Amar Rava. 
Says Rava, Hilchasa. This is the law. This is the halacha. Tachos mishtus nikna mekach. Less than one sixth is a is there's there's not even considered to be a fraud, and there is nothing to be reimbursed, and it happens right away. So that was our discussion the other week. Does it happen right away, or does it happen after consultation? Says says Rava, it happens right away. That it's almost as if it's a non-starter. And what's interesting in the discussion of the Rishonim, although no one pushes this point, is that if a person deliberately, deliberately uh, overcharges by less than a sixth, the Gazunster has got, then what's the what is the halacha? So the Mephorshim gleaned from this that if I that if let's say I charge you a little bit over. The, the 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 right price, but certainly less than a shnus, that there is no discussion, no quibbling. I can do that. It's a little bit of a on the edge because you know if, if you're charging, you should charge with the right prices. Right. But since we're saying the halacha is that it's less than a sixth, we almost overlook the fact that it might be a little bit more than the price, but less than a sixth. Yeah, Vanessa. So uh, the the I can see though some rationale for it. Uh, number one is. It could be that maybe even though it's nominally, you know, the the product is what it is, maybe you're known for giving a little extra service or whatever. So charging a little bit extra might be perfectly fine to right. the consumers. Right. The other thing, though, is the flip side is let's say that's not the case. Let's say it's something that's, you know, totally standardized and everybody sells it for a dollar and you're selling it for a dollar ten. And there's really no good reason. The delivery is the same. The product is the same. Everything going to happen is over time, enough people people are going to realize it and the word will get around and uh, people are going to go to the other merchants instead. Exactly right. Right. That, um, so, so in other words, the, the marketplace will dictate whether or not that's an appropriate thing to do. And you're 100% right. Sooner or later, they may say, why should we pay even the extra couple of pennies? But then again, like you say, there's service, there's convenience. He's always there. We can rely on him. Somebody else, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not there. This guy's there, thick or thin, rain or snow. And he may justify it by saying, look, I put myself out there for everybody and everybody's charging the same price, but I'm doing a little bit more than everybody else because everybody relies on me all the time, 24-7. But the bottom line is that there's no recourse. In other words, if he does it, there is no recourse because less than a sixth, there's, there's not even a, a pause to consult. It's right away upon to Rabbi. Right away, the halakha is that it is... Uh, Rabbi? Just, yeah. Uh, so if I'm the buyer, I'm automatically going to say it's more than a six that, that I was overcharged because I have no I have no grounds if it's less than a six. So Correct. I can still say that you know, I was, it was more than a sixth that I was, or a sixth or more than a sixth that I was overcharged. And you said it's right away, but you still have to prove that that's the case. So, right. right. So, so look, look, anybody can allege anything at any point in time. But like Menasha said, if, if it's pretty well known that this item is a dollar, I mean, it's known in the market, everybody knows it's a dollar store. You go, you pay a dollar, you walk out, that's it. If that's what it is, <laughs> the bag right? dollar stores have become a dollar and a quarter. It's more than a well, that, exactly right. So, so they're already over a shows. But, but in in the real world, Michael, when you go out and buy, you more or less we would say that most people more or less know what the price is because it's pretty much it's competitive and everybody knows. So, if somebody's charging consistently a little bit more, but uh, than the dollar, but but obviously less than the shtus. Then, then you have a choice. Do I go but to Rabbi, him? But Rabbi, I go down the Many a times I've gone for convenience to someone, even though it was a couple of pennies more, but it was absolutely convenient to do. So I did it. But conversely, I mean, today's world, it's organic, but it could have been grown in a more fertile valley. So it's, you know, it's a better quality product. Right. So that's why I'm, you know, right. you can say it's the regular price, but mine is a cut above. So that's why I'm- that, That's what his argument is. That's what he's justifying to himself to say, I can sell it for a little bit more than the dollar that everybody else is because my, I advertise mine as being uh, uh, organic or or, or or from the from the, from the the Napa Valley. My grapes are better. Who knows what? I don't know what. But but so that's why I don't understand how Rava can say, well, it's right away. Well, no, 
practically it's never going to be right away because from the halacha, the buyer in the case we ta we're talking about is going to allege that it's more than a sixth or a sixth, and therefore it's got to be dealt with. No, 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 what he's saying is that if the buyer complains that it's over but less than a sixth, it, end of story. It it, it becomes that, a meaningless thing. The if he says it's more, then that. you have an I mean, argument of can, is it really or not. It them, but it'll be thrown out of bezin. It'll be thrown out of bezin. Right. Because... right, I understand that. So that's why the buyer will never allege that. He will right. always never allege that. that it's a sixth or more. He'll never win that, correct. So so normally we're talking about well, the, maybe the seller sold it and he, maybe he didn't realize that he was selling it for a little bit more. Say some of the, uh, the Roshonim, he could they, he could originally intentionally know that it's more and still get away with it because according to the halacha, less than a six is automatically wiped out and there is no discussion. So he can do it, you know, up, up to a six. Let's say up to a six, but less than a six. And your point, Michael, if you hold on a little bit, we're going to see as an interesting situation which touches not exactly what you said, but it touches on what you said as to someone's intent. And, and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, a, a situation, uh, something like that. But for our purposes now, if it's less than a six and it's acknowledged, everybody knows it's less than a six, but it's but it's more than what would be the, the, the sort of the real objective price in the marketplace, there's no recourse. You immediately um, uh, give up the right to complain and the um, the seller can take it. So that, that's scenario number one. Scenario number two, according to Rava, Yoiser, meaning more than Shtus, Bittl Mekah, no questions. The, the, the Mekah is void. Either party that uh, can, um, can, uh, can break the deal and walk away, but they don't have to. So if the parties come together and say, even though it's more than a shus, we still will go, want to go along with the deal. Of course, they can make the deal. No one's going to stop them. It's just that the door is open for either party, either the defrauded or the fraud. In other words, even the guy who does the fraud can be miyashev and say, forget about it. I don't want to make the deal. So, And that's definitive. So those two extremes are definitive. Now we go to the middle ground, which until now we've been sort of vacillating. And now Rubba is going to give us the halacha shtus for an actual shtus, kono umachsa ono, the sale is automatically valid. Not like the Mishnah says, either or. He's, the Rabbi says the sale is valid, but the person who's been defrauded can be toveya, he can claim his shtus. That's what it's exactly a shtus. So this is the definitive halacha that Rabbi is telling us, which we've been alluding to for these last few weeks, not like the Mishnah, not like the Mishnah. The kono umachsa ono. That that's uh, now. What's the time frames involved? So he's just given us the different halach. But But in the case of an exact shtus, how much time do you have? He says you have as much time of the period that it would take to go to a uh, uh, an appraiser, an expert, or to your relative and show it to him, and then. And again, the, the Gemara is not giving us that time, but we're gonna we're gonna make it up, and we're gonna say, let's say it takes an hour, half an hour, whatever it is, and it's known that that's what it takes. That's what you do. So, in other words, you have a leeway, and let's say of a half hour, an hour, whatever it is, to come back. If you if you come back later than that time period, you have given up your right to the shtus, and you're locked in. You can't break the deal. So. Now by Puts the during pressure that, on the defrauded party. Go ahead. Yeah, Mike. During that half hour, does the seller have the right to sell those goods and no, the, substitute the, the, the others? Sales so limbo. he has to put them aside. Sale is in limbo until that period of time ends. And then, remember, that deal is not going to be obviated. He can't go back and sell to somebody else. It's either going to be collected on the shtus or he'll forfeit the shtus. But the deal is the deal. According to Rava, he's made a deal. Now the question is, oh, the guy's going to his appraiser and the appraiser says, you overpaid by your shtus. He says, I want my money back. So, so he goes back to the seller. I mean, they can quibble over it and everything, but at the end of the day, he's made his claim. And if you have to go to Bezin, you go to Bezin. Or if he says, okay, I'll give it to you. Let's just keep going, get on with it. Then uh, at least we know where we stand. So, so Rava is giving us now um, the definitive halacha. Now, 
So not only is that the halacha, but there is a brisa to that effect. Says the Gemara, Tanya Kabosi de Rabba, we're going to bring a brisa to prove Rabba's point. Why? Because it says in the brisa, this is the language of the brisa, I know pochos mishtus, if you have a fraud of less than a six, nik de mekach, the sale is valid. Yes, or al shtus, if it's more than a six, then bottle mekach, then the, the mekach, the sale um, is um, is obviated, it's, it's voided. Shtus, if it's exact shtus, tono maksa, you know, then if it's an exact amount, then um, he it's kone, the deal is done, but he can claim it. Who is the author of that price, sir? Divrei Rav Nossam. So in that price, there's a machloikis. It's actually machloikis. And we'll see how it plays out. Divrei Rav Nossam, these are the words of Rav Nossam. Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi Omer, Rabbi Yehuda Hanossi says, and we touched on this the other week. What does he say? Yad Mocher al Ho'elyonah. So he says Yad Mocher, but he doesn't mean the Yad Mocher. He means whoever has been defrauded Right, then he is the um, he is the um, sort of the instigator of this. He's the one who uh, uh, leads the claim. In other words, um, which in a sense is obvious because if the seller is defrauded, then he's going to want to get his six. If the buyer is defrauded, he's going to want to get his six. Um, but in the case, but in the case. Um, According to Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, now Rabbi Yehuda Anasi is who the author of the Mishnah. What does the Mishnah say on Shtus? Our Mishnah says on Shtus, it's either or, right? So Rabbi Nasan, who is the first part of the Brisa, he echoes the words of Rava that it's either less is nothing, more is 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 void, and exact Shtus is not void, but you get your money back. It's Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Who was a giant? He was the the Sadr of the Mishnah, and he came along and he said, "No, uh, that's not the case." It, it, the, the halacha, again, according to our Mishnah, is that in the case of an exact shtus, you have a choice, right? You can either obviate the deal or just get your money back. That's Rabbi Yudah Hanasi. So, in Rabbi Yudah Hanasi's position, it's Yodo Alha Al Yona who gets to make the choice of obviating the deal or just getting the money back. It's the person who was defrauded, the seller or the buyer. So now we understand that our Mishnah goes against the halacha, goes against what Rava is saying. The author of our Mishnah is Rabbi Yudah Hanasi, right? Which, who's quoted in this brisa, And Rabbi Yudah Hanasi says, I agree that less than a shtus, deal done. More than a shtus, it's voidable by both sides. But an exact shtus, the defrauded party makes the choice because he is Yodo al Yona, he is the victim. So now the, the, the Machlokis is clearly in our mind that the, the that that um, Brisa validates Rava's halacha, and Rabbi Yudanos is the dissenting party. But again, in the hierarchy of the Tanoyim, Rabbi Nosson was a step above uh, Rabbi Yudanos, even though Rabbi Nosson was, was the Messiah of the of the Mishnah, and he's considered the father of the Mishnah, but Rav was the was the the, the, the bigger gadol, let's say. So, so the, the halacha would normally be like the bigger gadol, which in this case is Rav Nassim. And who does Rav Nassim hold like? He holds like Rava. So now we have the imprimatur of the halacha because Rav Nassim holds like Rava, even though Rabbi Danasi doesn't. And and now we understand why our Mishnah says either or, because that's Rabbi Danasi's. Uh, 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 position. So says the rest of that price. So according to Rabbi Yudah Nasi, you have a choice. You can give me my money back or just give me the differential, right? Um, and, um, and and what's the time limit? So he says, both shtus and more than a shtus. Shtus and more than a shtus. The time limit is um, it's it's as much time as you need to go to your uh, to your relative, whoever it happens to be, or to the um, uh, to the expert, the appraiser. <laughs> so so that's Rabbi Yudah Nosson's position. It's different than Rabbi Nosson, and he adds that caveat that it's Yada Al Yona, which means it's either party has the choice of either obviating or just getting the ayno, and that's 
how we leave. That's how we leave it. That's now we understand fully the Mishnah's position, Rabbi Yudah Nasi in the Brayse, or Rava's position, which is endorsed by Rav Nasi. And, we, and the halacha is like Rava because Rav Nasi, That's Rav Nasi's position. So, so then, if you had a unscrupulous seller who knew these rules, it would be to his benefit to say, uh, the, you know, and let's say he consistently charges uh, it's a dollar, and he charges a dollar and a quarter, twenty five percent over, knowing that a lot of people aren't going to know the real prices and they'll get away with it. And somebody comes in and starts questioning and saying, "Oh, dollar quarter, like, uh, oh my goodness, wait a minute, isn't that more than a sixth? We've got a problem here." Uh, as soon as he gets a hint of it, he should, he should start like discounting it to you know a uh, dollar fifteen, just under a sixth, because then he can just uh, he can make that amount of money. Whereas if he if I understand this correctly, I might not. If it goes to the real <laughs> consultation and the guy comes back, the guy can say, "I want it, but for a dollar." Right. So you're you're absolutely right, and what this gives rise to. Unfortunately, there are uh, unscrupulous, uh, let's say, sellers. I mean, we'll go from that position. There are unscrupulous sellers, and they'll test the marketplace. They'll see what they can get away with. And then when they can't get away with it, then they'll start negotiating, manipulating, and going back and forth. And unfortunately, that position has 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 survived the test of time because from the, from the very beginning of time till today, that's the game between buyers and sellers always is to sort of come to a common price. And what's very interesting is that this whole art of negotiation, which allegedly maybe came out of the Middle East, I don't know that that's really where it actually came out of, but you know, this, this what we call the haggling of price, oh yeah, the, the, the market-based price, that's really an, an offshoot of what we're talking about in the Gemara, which you just pointed out, Manasha, is that, is that you know, b b sellers will uh, inevitably test the market. And, and if they find a, an, an unknowing or an innocent, naive uh, buyer, uh, they'll get away with something that, um, you know, they shouldn't. Now, uh, you'll be down the cops, of course, that they didn't know the right price. So they picked the price out of the air and it was the wrong price. So now you come back. OK, I'm sorry. I'm willing to uh, give you the right price. I didn't know. But that's all within the, you know, within the four corners of, of, of the deal. And um, and we're going to see a very interesting case in a minute, which I mentioned uh, to Michael that I'm just going to uh, we're going to talk about where where this game is played out very clearly between the buyer and the seller. So let's um, let's. Can uh, I just make one comment? Uh, it reminds me when I my first job was in New York and I had to buy a bed for the apartment I was renting and I went to um, furniture companies on the Lower East Side. And this is what's going to happen. It, you, you went back and forth and, and haggled with them and then you ended up with your price. And then I called the other guy back and he said, that guy can't hold on a second. He can't be charging you that price. He, I held on for about three minutes. He came back and he said, buy it from him. You know, there's no way he can afford to do that. That's right. that was business. And I assume that that that's what ended up happening. Exactly. In, uh, exactly in right. The olden days, you know. Right. But, but, but again, most businessmen don't even consult the Gemara or the Halacha. They do what right. they have to do. Right. The scrupulous ones are the ones who are very careful not to be over, uh, you know. In other words, if I know that my I'm ask, that I want to ask a price that is more than a shtus. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't find the unwary buyer and take advantage of him. That's not really right. But uh, human nature being what it is, uh, it may or may not happen more than we know. But but someone who's erlach, uh, you know, he's very very careful to to before he gets on the maybe he does his research and says I don't want to be over the law of shtus. I don't want to take advantage of someone who may not know. So let me go out and, and sort of see what the price is, and I'll and I'll price mine accordingly. But again, well, they, it's it's wide well, open. Yeah, Jay. The whole world today is one big shook, and right. the thing is that it Americans is. Americans don't normally operate that way. You see the price on the sticker. And you go to the cash register and you pay what it is. That's right. But so another, people aren't used to handling, reason. which is maybe uh, many people around <laughs> the world. They, they're the ones, I mean, maybe they find it distasteful that they should have a negotiation and a thing. Again, it's, it's part of your culture. It's part of who you are. But you're right. I mean, it could be that Americans, and maybe we've changed, but as a, a matter of course, you know, it was kind of distasteful 
to, to, to get into the mud and start negotiating and, you know, uh, uh, back and forth and bickering. So I don't want to use the pejorative terms that have been associated with that kind of business. But the fact is that many people look down on it and, and say, that's not the way I want to buy. I want to go in, there's a sticker price, you give me a hanukkah, I'll buy it, and that's it. But that, in a way, that's naive thinking because that's not the way of the world, like you say. It's one big marketplace. Yeah. In Machane Yehuda, come on yeah. Friday afternoon, everything is negotiable. Absolutely. What Absolutely. are you willing to pay? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know how scrupulous the merchants of Machane Yehuda are, but I'll give them this. They are they're out to make a buck, and um, they know their competition because they're all lined up. They're all... So if they all hold the line, it's good. If one guy doesn't hold the line, then all of them better quickly, um, you know, because one guy's going to sell out and the other guy's going to be left holding the bag. And an Arab Shabbos, you don't want to do that. Okay. Just a chronological note, Rabbi, before we leave it. Uh, this seems to be one of those situations where the Talmud poses uh, scholars a couple of hundred years apart as if they're talking to each other. That's correct. Uh, you know, um, Tanoim and uh, Amaroyim, and Correct. The rubber looks like he's back there a couple of hundred years before talking to these others, but that, that's the way the Talmud sets it up many times. Right. So I'll take license and and say, like we said, there's a machlokis between Rashi and the Ramban and others uh, on the concept of a muktum mukhar batayra. Right. That there's a fairly famous discussion, and we had it in this week's parsha because we're talking about Nasa Venishma after. Um, after Yeser Sadibris. How is that possible? So Rashi says, in Mukta Mukhabatera, comes the Ramban and says, no, it means that they said it after Matan Taira. They didn't say it by Matan Taira, says the Ramban and others. So now you have this, this tug of war. And like you're saying, you have Rava who says something. And, but who's he, who's he talking about? He's in a vacuum because he's talking about people 100 years before him. So I'll say, we put them all together. We talk about Rava and this one and that one as if they were contemporaneous, even though they're not. But in our mind, when we talk about Torah and Halacha, you know, we, we, you know, we don't make that distinction very often. But you're right to point it out, David. <laughs> all, co all colleagues. What's that? All colleagues. All colleagues. Exactly right. Exactly right. Colleagues and Tyra. Okay, so now, um, so the Gemara a little bit, let's go a little bit weiter. So now we've, we've, we've sort of framed the Machlaikis. Says the Gemara, uh, okay, so we've had this discussion uh, on the time frame to recant. Says the Gemara, Admosan Mutala Haksir. So how much time does he have to uh, return the item. And we said that uh, he has the time to show it to a mechta letagio um, lekrogo. Okay, now, now the Gemara is gonna get into the, the, a more specific point, which we talked about a week or two ago. And this now we're, boy, we're bringing it together. Says the Gemara, Omar of Nachman, lo shone el lokeach. This discussion of bichte shiir letagio lekrogo only applies to a buyer. In other words, when the when it says that you can go and bring it, if you, you, you show it for examination, it's only to the buyer. Remember what we said: a mocher can always retract. He does not have any time limit. So we have to understand what's the basis of that machlokes. Why is that machlokes even extend? So let's take a look. If Rashi says it. it um, um, says Rashi in the first of the, uh, the uh, two lines from the bottom from the, of, of, the, of the wide lines. So he says, Elo lokeach she mecho biyodo biyocho laharos. You know why the buyer has the opportunity to go to the Tigre uh, to the um, yeah to the uh, to, to the tagir or to the karav because he's holding the chayfets the buyer just bought it from the seller and there's a question of whether or not it's the right price so it's natural for him to go to someone to show it mocher however the mocher she'ebiyodo malaharos the limlo he he gave it up right he sold it he doesn't have a possession. 
Eina makir ba'inoso at shiira talos acheres kidemusa nim keres bedamim yikarim. How will he know whether he committed price fraud, whether he sold it too little, too much? How will he know? Only when he goes back into the marketplace. Now, we're not talking about um, uh, sellers who are experts and they know the marketplace before they go into the marketplace. We're talking about a seller who goes into the marketplace. He charges a certain amount, um, more or less what he thinks is the right price, and then the buyer gets it. Now, the question is, okay, did he do right? Says the Gemara, he has an unlimited amount of time in this scenario to undo the purchase and say, mistake, it's fraud. In other words, uh, fraud, okay? I, I'm, it's, a mis it's a mistake, and I wanna, and I wanna open up the, uh, the deal again to uh, either the shtus or more than the shtus. But why? Rashi says because he has no merchandise to go to the tiger. He can't go to an appraiser or to his friend and say, did I sell this for the right price? Because he doesn't have it. The buyer has it. That's why the Gemara says the buyer has until Tagre or until a Chaver because he has the opportunity of walking over. We're going to give him half an hour, an hour, fine. The seller has nothing to show anybody. When is he going to know if, if, he, if he made a big mistake? Only when he goes into the marketplace and he sees the other guys selling the product and say, wait a minute. These guys are selling it for this dollar. I made a total mistake. I am way, way too low. So that's the first time, says Rashi, right? Achiyira, Talos Acheres, the bottom line, until he sees another Talos um, Kidemusa, Nimkeres, Bidam, and Yikarim, until he sees that same object sold for more money. Here, says Rashi, therefore the Gemara says he can always Kaiser, Imlonis Kaim, Talos Ben Kayim. Oh, but there's one caveat. The caveat is that if the price of the talisman went up from the time of his sale until he went into the marketplace, and now he sees, oh my gosh, these price, these talisman are much more expensive. No, no, no. You can't go back and undo the deal if it increased in price after you made the sale, and now you want to take advantage of the price increase. That says you're not allowed to do. So the door is open for you to check the price of your competition even after the sale and then come back to the buyer and say, I'm exercising my right and I want to, uh, whether it's a shus or more than a shus, depending on whether you hold like rubber, let's say the I want to undo the deal or I want my six back. So th that's why the Gemara says there's a difference in how we look at it from the buyer standpoint, because he has the item or the seller standpoint, because he no longer has the item and he has to sort of go out into the marketplace. So that, that's how the Gemara explains what we had been saying in the last few weeks, that when the Mishnah says that there's it, it, that it goes to the Tagar or to the Chaver, it's only for the Lokeya, for the buyer. But for the seller, it's La'olam, it uh, he can always retract. Rabbi, uh, that, that troubles me a lot, because when you say always can retract, um, the, a sales made... Are you saying that if he a guy goes and says after the sale is completed that you know I checked this out you know uh, the buyer says I checked this out and really it's uh, more than a shtus higher than I should have paid can the seller at that point in time retract the deal? Yes. Are you saying that he has unlimited ability to retract that deal? That's what the Gemara is saying. Yes. So, so I don't have to abide by anything. If the buyer objects, I don't have to abide by anything. I can pull it out out no, of it no, whenever no, no, I want. No. If you're going to give me a hard time, you either buy it for what I say, or I'm not going to. I'm not going to include the deal. I thought it was locked once, uh, based on the circumstances. Once, no, no. If the if the buyer is objecting, he has that limited window of going to a tagir or to a chaver because. He has the ability to take the item and immediately show it to other people, says, says Rashi explaining the Gemara. And because he can do that, we don't give him an open window. The but wait a minute. On the but, other hand, has now relinquished the item to the buyer. He no longer has it. But, but so wait a minute. If the buyer says, I am not sure about this, you said at any point, and if I miss No, no, not the buyer. No, no. Uh, let, me clear, let me make clear. I'm talking about the seller. The seller. At correct. any point. So if the buyer starts objecting, 
what you're implying is a seller can pull the deal, even if the buyer objects, even if it's over, he can say, look, we don't have a deal. So forget about it. Is that what you're saying? Uh, right. So if the seller has verified through outside sources a day, two days later, whatever it is, and said, goes back to the buyer. Remember, we're talking about they live in the same village. They know each other. As he goes back to Yankel and says, Yankel, I sold you this item yesterday. It's a mistake. Mecca toast. I have to retract or you have to give me the difference of a, of a shtus because I made a terrible mistake. And the halacha sides with me, the seller, that I, since I didn't have the item with me and I really was foolish because I sold it way below what it should have been. So you have to reimburse me or I have a right. Uh, in other words, if it's exactly a six, he can't undo the deal. He has to take Yankel to the Bezdin and he has to say to the Bezdin, Bezdin, this is what happened. Uh, it's, there is a shtus involved. I want to collect my shtus. I want the Bezdin to, to uh, support me and, and, and Paskin that I can get my shtus. If it's more than a shtus, he absolutely goes to Yankel and says, Yankel, either we redo the deal or, or, or give it to me back because I made a terrible mistake. I'm going to sell it to, to Baruch for the right price if you don't give me my uh, the price I'm asking. But, but if the buyer says, I'm going to I'm going to call an expert. Right. I'm going to go see an expert. I'll get back to you in a half an hour. Right. Does the does the seller have a right to say at that point? The deal's off because you're not agreeing to it. The deal's no. off. I'm not selling. No, absolutely not. He has to, I heard he you has say to, he the has seller to give the has buyer. the ability at any point in time to pull the deal. Yeah. I, so, so in your first example, he has to give the buyer the window of a half an hour to get a a a, a um, an appraisal from a friend or or from the thing, right? He has to give him that window of a half an hour. If that's what he wants. Number one. Number two. Um, under what circumstance would the seller say I retract? Because I don't want to deal with the Bach locus. No, no, no. The only only window he has is if he has some basis to say I I, I sold it improperly. Okay, he can't, okay. He can't say I don't like your shirt. I want to undo the deal. He has to say I made a bad mistake, and here's the proof. And so he has to have evidence that it uh, is correct. Outside the have evidence. in order to undo it. Otherwise, the otherwise. Deal yeah, I'm sorry. I and, 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 and the halacha is that, which we just said, that he has to have exact evidence that at the time of the sale, this was the price. Not that it, oh, there was an appreciation on the market and all of a sudden this, this item is worth twice the amount. You can't renege because you want to do a better deal because it's better than the deal you did at the time. If at the time you made a right deal because the, the number was right, you're locked in, even if it uh, appreciates three times or four times the amount. That but you can't do. Here's what I don't understand about the seller's supposed to know the market. The buyer is buying for his needs. The seller's yes, supposed to know the yes. market. Yes. So what I don't understand is if the seller did not do his due diligence in finding out what the price was, you know, the price had increased, you know, by 20% across the board, and he didn't do his due diligence why does he have the right to undo that that was his decision and because the market changed that very day you know you're putting the buyer in an unfortunate position the seller is supposed to know his business well you make a valid point and objectively that should be a very definitive argument the problem with that is is that Chazal or the I mean the the uh, the Tanar the Amoraim the Tanoim when they were going through sort of the etiquette of business, they didn't want to just dump on the seller and say the seller's got to be the one who knows everything, and therefore he sells it at his own risk because he should know. That, that's what you're saying, and L'chaira, that makes sense. The seller's the one who's bringing the, the item to market. He should be the one who is, uh, who's, who's making the price, and he should, he should bear the consequences of his, of his pricing. The Gemara doesn't say that, though. The Gemara says that we have Rahmanus on the seller, too. The seller, at times, could be just a simple fellow who, who, who's in business, doesn't have sophistication, and he says, okay, I'm, I'm going to sell it at this number, and he's naive. So we're protecting him against himself for his own naivete. Now, the Gemara is going to make a distinction in a minute because you're going to see a distinction between different types of sellers, but we're talking about a commercial seller 
who wants to sell an item in the marketplace, hasn't done his homework, doesn't know from his due diligence what the price should be, but he, yeah, I think this is the right price, and he goes out. And probably in, in most small villages, that's the way things were done. How many times did someone sell a cow or a lamb or a or a, a plow? I mean, those weren't items that were flying off the shelf. So he approximated what the cost should be. He made a bad mistake. We're not going to penalize him. We're going to say, you made a bad mistake. We're going to cover you. And, and again, it's fair to the buyer because the buyer got a windfall. If he bought something at such a low price that it was a windfall, then we're going to say, you know, worse off if we change it and give the seller a break because that's the real price. So it's not as if you're overpaying now. You're paying, you should have paid in the beginning, but the seller didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So th th this is the rationale. Rashi is giving us the rationale between the buyer and the seller. And um, as to what it is. Now, we have an interesting here, Gemara Vaita. So now, okay, um, so Rab Nachman makes this chilek between the buyer and the seller. Name a Messiah lay. We're going to bring a, um, uh, a Mishnah of Raisa to prove Rab Nachman's point. How? Our Mishnah says, this is very interesting. What does our Mishnah say? Then in the beginning, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the merchants follow the Rabbanon. Came Rab Tarfin, and he says, no, it's not a shtus, it's not a sixth, it's a third. What did the merchants do, especially the Tagre Lud? They jumped to Rab Tarfin. Oh, now we're going to make a windfall killing because according to Rab Tarfin, the difference between one-sixth and one-third, which is substantial, is immediately Michael because a third is now the threshold according to Rab Tarfin. So there's not there's no there is no um, going back there's no retracting, but Rav Tarfin says, oh by the way, but I'm going to give them a day, right? That this is the Mishnah repeating the Mishnah. So what happens when he said I'm going to give them a day? Immediately says the so the Mishnah Chazru the 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 merchants went back to the rabbis' uh, view because at least according to the rabbis, even though it was a six versus a third. But it was a half hour versus a day. And they figured that most deals that are going to go wrong are going to go wrong on the lower part of the economic totem pole, meaning a sixth rather than a third. And so they'd rather get a de minimis amount of a sixth because of the half hour window versus the potential for a bigger windfall of a third which is far less likely, says Rashi before, and have to wait a day. So that was their calculation. Again, the Tagre Lud were very sharp merchants, and they said, on balance, we rather side with the Rabbanon than with the Tarkin. Okay, that's the Mishnah. So, so now let's read. Name of Messiah, we're going to bring a riot to Rab Nachman. The Mishnah says, that after they heard Rab Tarkin say, you have a day, then they went back to the rabbis. So now let's understand both sides of this equation. If you say, remember, remember what did Rabbi Nachman say? That the, uh, the mocha can always retract and the buyer can only have a window to retract. Now, if you're going to say that the mocha can always retract, no, no time limit, if you're going to say that, then... Uh, and now we're on Mishum Hochi Chazri. That's why the Tagre Lud went back to the rabbis because of that window of a day that the Tarfim gave them, which they didn't like. Because why should they? Why should he give them all that amount of time? So it says the Gemara. That makes sense if you say that the Moicher can always retract. But it's the buyer who can't retract. And now the buyer has a smaller window to retract. Now we understand why the Tagre Lud uh, went back to the rabbis. Ela'i Amrit. But if you say, Mocher nami kalokeach dami, that the Mocher is like the Lokeach, just like the Lokeach has a window of a half an hour. The Mocher has a window of a half an hour. If you're going to say that, remember, we're trying to bring a riot. But if you're going to say that he, that the Mocha and the, and the Lokeach are the same, my nafkila mina, 
what is now the difference between uh, um, uh, to the Tagli Lud? What does it matter? Why the, why did they leave Reb Tarfin? Just like the rabbis made a takana for the lokeach that he has a window, they made the same extension to the mocher, meaning what? That they allowed him the same time frame. If it's the same time frame, then why did they abandon Rav Tarfin and go to the rabbis? There's no difference between the mocher and the lokeach. The only reason to abandon the only reason to abandon is if they have it better. They, meaning the, the, the sellers, who are the Tagre Lut, if they have it better because they have forever to retract. It's only the buyer who is squeezed. Then, okay, now they went back to the rabbis because it's better for them with the rabbis who say 30 minutes, a half hour and not a whole day. But if you're going to say that the, that the Moche and the Lokea both have a half an hour, I mean, that they're equal in every respect, then you might as well stick with Reptarfin because now you have a bigger window of collecting between a sixth and a third because the amount of time to retract is the same for both. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're holding like Reptarfin or the rabbis, they will all say the same thing. So now let's go with the better deal. The better potential deal is Reptarfin because he says a third, which means that between a sixth and a third, you can be Michael. So LMI, because we don't say that, this is the riot. It's all sort of like that. We're backing into the riot. We're backing into the riot because if they, if they were actually equal, then it would not make sense to say Chazru or Rabbana. The only way it says Chazru or Chachamim is if you hold that, that um, uh, if you hold that the Meichar has forever, then it's to the Meichar's advantage to swing to the, uh, to the, the Tagri Lulu or the Meichrim. It's to their advantage to go after the rabbi because after after the rabbanon, that's that small window, and then they will make uh, make their deal. So um, says the Gemara. That's why we have a proof that it has to be that the meicher has an unlimited amount of time, the lokeach doesn't, which is why <clears throat> the tagre lud when they heard Rav Tarfin say we're going to give him a day, they said no way. We rather go with the rabbis and 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 limit our profit to a shtus, not a third, but at least have the greater likelihood of collecting because it's only a half an hour rather than a whole day. So now that that was the Gemara's raya that um, the Xalitical Rashi Mishim Hakri Chazri the top Rashi and Nun Aluf Amid Aluf Mishim Hakri Chazri Shem Hayom Moichrim they were the sellers the Einin Nehenin Bahachavas Man Achazara Durab Tarfin. They did not benefit from the expanded amount of time that Rav Tarfin gave them. Because even according to the rabbis, you're always able to chazer. So why did they go back? It must be, So it must be that the moicher that has an unlimited amount of time. So the Tagrelu said, okay, our interest is protected. So now, where will we be better off? Waiting a day according to Tarfin, or waiting a half an hour or thereabouts according to the rabbis? We're better off with Chazrul and Rabbanon to go back to the rabbi Shita. And, and, and again, the windfall might be less because it's only a sixth rather than a third, but it's more likely to happen because, again, they, they say that the, 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 uh, the, the, the deals that are more likely to fall into this sphere are the smaller deals, the ones that require a shtus for, um, for, um, for ribis, or for, um, for, uh, for oino, and not those that require a third. Because the idea is that the bigger the price amount, the greater the sophistication. Whether that's true or not uh, is a question. Again, Michael, you may uh, think about that. But in, in other words, once you get into the bigger realm of Pointer of Tyrfin, maybe maybe the buyers and sellers are a little bit more sophisticated because a third is a, is a is a fairly substantial amount of money. So so they may not um, relinquish that, and therefore giving them a day is basically tantamount to saying they're going to undo the deal because. They're going to inquire, and they're not going to be limited in just a half an hour. So, excuse me, Rabbi. So that's the Gemara's proof that um, that uh, it has to be uh, the Meicher is unlimited amount of time, and the uh, buyer is not.
Now, is this how it turned out practically? Yes. Which yeah, way practice, and that's, that way. Way. that's how it turned out practically is that is that uh, most of the transactions in the time of the Gomorrah here that we're talking about are the, the, the transactions between buyers and sellers, not sophisticated transactions that we think of global, the global network. You're talking about Yang and Baruch. They, 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 they live in a town. They, they're not connected to the greater world. They don't know what's going on in the, in the next town five miles away. They just deal with their Balabatim where they are. And it's, it's totally a local economy. So in a local economy, uh, we say that the buyer has the advantage because he has the chayfets and he can go around to several people asking, is this a good deal? Did I make a mistake? The seller, again, we're not crediting him with any sophistication. We're saying that he he made a price. He thinks it's fair, but it turns out to his to his uh, detriment that it wasn't fair. And if it wasn't fair, then the then the then the, uh, and the rabbis say, we shouldn't penalize him just because he made a mistake and he didn't know what the right number was. So we give him uh, we give him the right to um, to uh, to retract. He gets the longer time period to make sure it's right. not over the top. But, not over well, the Rabbi, top. pragmatically, how long is forever? I mean, uh, that's a very good question, Michael. What is forever? Is forever and ever and ever? Because by the time he wakes up and finds out the right price, he could have consumed the item already, right? If it was a fungible item. Exactly. So you could go back to him afterward and you, you didn't record right. all those. Right. So this, this becomes, this becomes a complicated. Yes, you're 100% right. And so there's different interpretations of what Loyola means, whether it means 30 days or because you're right. If it's a fungible item, a, a bushel of oranges, he ate the oranges, he paid the money. What's he going to do? He's not. A, he doesn't have an orchard. How is he going to? Re, how is he going to return the oranges? Right. By that time, he spent the money. He doesn't have it. So and there, there and Rabbi, there's other practical considerations. Somebody might have come in and bought. Um, three bushels instead of one bushel so he asks for a price concession and that and the, the seller comes back and says well i'm going to give him a price concession and he realizes well because most people don't buy three bushels at a time but he right. has you know and by, a yeah, large right. extended family and then he said well i i gave you too big a discount i mean this can go on forever except that michael the the circumstances um, that we're talking about have to be the exact circumstances of the deal. In other words, if the if if he makes a deal later and it's for three versus one or something else, you can't equate that and say, "Oh, I made a mistake because I sold him three bushels at this number and I sold him one." It has to be identical facts. In other words, no. But I'm saying he deal. sold three bushels to this guy, and usually he sells one bushel. So he said, "Because of volume, and I'm getting rid of my merchandise, I'm going to give you a twenty percent discount." Right. And, and that, then that, he said, "Well, that was too much afterward, and it was more than a shtus." So yeah, it's, but that, see, that can't factor into this equation. In other words, if it is on all fours, if it isn't an exact replica of the deal that we are talking about, then you can't make a comparison <clears throat> and say, oh, I made a mistake here. You have to reimburse me because I made this mistake because of what I sold to Yankel at one bushel. So the Gemara, I mean, all everybody says the clearly that the deals have to be lined up exactly the same. But as to the question of how much is thing, there is a general consensus. And again, I, I haven't seen where it's actually la meaning la ilam voed that it, that it means thirty days. So la ilam thirty days is a pretty long amount of time to say that he has that amount of time. I, I'll look at it further for next week, but I don't believe I saw um, uh, uh, anything that would suggest that la ilam means la ilam voed. In other words, it's not like the ed, but still a um, longer, longer time uh, than would normally be considered, you know, between buyer and seller. Normally, when I mean, you can see it by today, uh, a lot of stores give you a seven day, a seven day refund or a three day refund or whatever, 30 day, whatever, 30 day is common. Uh, so in the time of the Gemara, uh, you know, what was logical? So but Rabbi, uh, some uh, places charge more to give you unlimited time for refunds. So that, that's know, correct. That's also that's correct. has to be factored into the price. So, so you have to, you, that's right. That's your insurance policy right. that, if it, that you'll pay a little bit more, but you'll have peace of mind. Exactly right. Exactly right. So now, so, so the Chaira, what do we do? We have a Raya 
right? It's a raya to Rav Nachman. Says the Gemara in its in, inimitable way, no raya. Why is there no raya? Tagre lud lo shiach And this is a wonderful parrot, is that the tagre lud rarely make a mistake. In other words, this goes back to what we were talking about before. These are sophisticated sellers. They don't make mistakes. They know exactly what the price is. So if they charge a price, it's, you can't come back later and say, oh, they made a mistake. No, 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 there's no mistakes here. But if you say that there's no mistakes, then the whole union of, of unlimited amount of time falls away. You know why there's no there's, there's an unlimited amount of time? Because the Tagore Lud never make mistakes. That's why. But in any other case, you know. So this is an interesting way of the Gemara answering the question is that um, is that the Tagore Lud are, are different. Okay. So um, we started a little bit late. So I just want to go into this next line, this, this thing, because it's a very interesting, um, uh, very interesting discussion. So now the Gemara brings down the following discussion um, to whether to 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 say whether or not Rav Nachman's halacha is correct or not, right? So this is Rav Nachman himself. Okay, says the Gemara. So uh, I have to look up the word. It, it, he said it means the balabos, the landlord where Rami Bar Chama lived. He was a seller uh, of wine. Zavin Chamra, he's a wine seller. Vita, and he made a mistake and he charged too little for the wine. Ashkeche the Hava Azuv. So uh, Rami Barhama came to him and he saw that he was uh, he was sad, he was upset. On Malay, he said to him, to the landlord, Amai Atzap, why you why are you sad? So he said, Zabina Chamra. Um, I made a mistake and I sold this wine for too little and I I, I, I hurt myself by selling it for too little. Omale, so Rabbi Bacham said to him, Zil what are you talking about? Go back and undo the deal. So Rabbi Bacham is telling the, the, the guy, don't worry about it, just undo the deal. Omale, Hashali Yosef Bechdesha Aramitago Lekrovai. The landlord was a Talmud Chacham. And he said to Rabbi Bacham, but wait a minute, more time has passed for me to go and consult with somebody, my friend or, or somebody else. How can you tell me to go and do the deal? I already missed my window. My window was to go to a expert, right? Um, so, so that's what he said to him. So, um, uh, okay, right. So it says, so Shadu Lekhamed Rav Nachman. So he said, okay, fine, let's go to Rav Nachman. So Rami Bachama took him to Rav Nachman. And what did Rav Nachman say? Only the Lokeya has the time limitation of a Tagre or a Haver. You are the seller. You can retract. You can always retract. So in other words, even though the Gemara just got through saying, it's no riot to Rav Nachman because the Tagre Lud don't make mistakes. But we see in the incident between Rav Nachman, uh, Rabbi Bar Chama, and his landlord, and he's not Tagre Lud. This guy is not a big time merchant like the Tagre Lud. He's a regular merchant. He happens to have a, like a, a little wine factory. And he sold wine and he made a mistake. And Rami Bar Chama said to him, You didn't make, you didn't lose out because you can go back because. The halacha is like Rav Nachman. So this is the raya to Rav Nachman that a meichel la'olam chayzeh. Frek the Gemara. My tamam. What is the reason? So now the Gemara is going to explain what we said before. What's the reason why Rav Nachman, why Rav Nachman said what he did? Lokeach mekho biyado. The buyer has the purchase in his hand. Kol heche de ozol machzalei. He can show it to whoever he wants. And he asks around, did I make a mistake? The seller who no longer has the, the item in his hand because he sold it. It's only when he finds other people selling it that he will know if he made a mistake. If he didn't make a mistake. 
So this is the rationale. This is what Rashi said before we read the Rashi. And now the Gemara is saying that this is the rationale uh, that uh, between whether or not you're a buyer or you're a seller. So if you're a buyer, you, you have the evidence in front of you, you can make the deal. If you have, if not, then um, you, you can't make the deal. Okay, so now, well, just as one other, because I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to get to something that, Michael, you pointed out, and I just want to not forget it. Hahu Gavra was this person, the Havinoke Varshave uh, 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 There was a, a person who had um, uh, silk items. Rashi says, Vajshave, Kishure, Mashi, Shikorin, and Bindalish. Uh, he had certain silks or, or other fabrics that he wanted to sell in the marketplace. So now this, 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 here's what he did. Okay, so let's pay attention. He he said, I'm selling it for six zuz, but he knew it was five. He knew it was five, but he sold it for six. So right away you have shtus. Right away you have a six. But he knew that if someone came to negotiate and said, I'll give you five and a half, right? Then Chosa Shokel, then he would uh, uh, then he would take it. He'd take it. Why? Because he he knew it was worth five. And he's asking for six, which is a shtus, but he would take five and a half. Now, here's the story. Osahu Gavra Omar. There was a buyer who was a pretty smart guy, and he came to the fellow and he said, and he says, Hmm, I know that this item is five shekels, and I know he's selling it for six shekels. If I will give him five and a half, have a mechila. According to Rava, it's absolute mechila, and you can't retract. Etelashita. I'll give him his price. I'll give him the entire six shekel. Why? Because then the Isabel Ladina, and I'm going to take him to Bezdin. Because then I'll get away with it and I'll only have to pay five instead of five and a half because the Bezdin is going to give me the shekel back because he's going to have, right? Exactly. So the buyer was a smart guy and he says, why should I negotiate and pay five and a half? Let me pay six. I overpaid by a shtus. Rubber says, I get my shekel back. I'll go to best and I'll get my shekel back. End of story. <laughs> so the, the seller wanted to outsmart the buyer, and the buyer outsmarted the seller. Says the Gemara, also the Kamei de Rava. Listen to this. They came before Rava. Rava who said this halacha, because he's a mom. So he says, now, so here is the chilek. Lo shana, omale. So he said, lo shana, ele belo keach menat pagor. The only time Rava's halacha is valid is if you go to the marketplace and you're dealing with a commercial seller, somebody who's in the marketplace to sell, that's fine. But if you're buying from a balabayas, meaning he is not a commercial seller, he happens to have a couple of shmatas, he has the silk, he has this, oh, fine, I'm going to sell it. When you're dealing with an unsophisticated seller, meaning a balabayas, then all bets are off. You can't then go back and take him to Bezdin. Why? Why is this? Um, because um, he's making a distinction that a person, and we'll stop here, but we'll, we'll see um, further. What's the point? The point is that a person who is not a commercial seller sells it on emotion. He sells it, let's say, oh, I, I, I have a yard sale. We, we go by these places, they have yard sales. What are they, commercial sellers? They bring out all their stuff from the basement. They put it on the lawn. Everybody comes over, they pick over. Oh, I like this, I like that. I'll pay you this, I'll pay you that. Oh, sure. So what does the guy do? He always charges more, the balabais. He says, oh, this is a great item. It's worth six shekel. Nah, I'm going to give it, I'll, I'll give you five and a half shekel for it. So you're dealing with the totally unsophisticated buyer and seller. Says, Rava, my halacha doesn't apply. My halacha applies to sophisticated buyers and sellers. Therefore, if you're going to pay five and a half, Yes, you're going to be Michael, and it's all over. So, that, Rabbi, that's... these are sophisticated buyers and sellers, even though they're not in a commercial business. Well, so again, why do they get exonerated? 
Michael, transport yourself to the second century and, and ask yourself how many sophisticated buyers and sellers were there. Everybody was buying, I was buying your broken down uh, ox cart and you were buying my lame cow. I mean, come on, everybody was just, they, they, so if you have a Tagre Lut, really you have sophisticated sellers, that's a whole different ball game, says Robo. But if you're buying between me and you, just friend to friend, then we don't, we, we look at it differently. It's a, it's a different the Mahala. I understand it's not quite. But they're manipulating this. I mean, the, the seller knew exactly what he was doing. The buyer knew exactly what he was doing. So under that precept, you're saying, you know, they're trying to undermine the halacha in terms of what they're trying to do, and you're going to let them get away with it. It's so so, so I, I think what we have to say is, even though we have definitive halacha from Rava, we have to put an asterisk next to his halacha and say, Rava, your halacha applies in the real world with real buyers, real sellers, in, in the marketplace, in the marketplace. But between Oren Lechavero and maybe 50% of deals are Oren Lechavero. We don't know. I mean, uh, maybe it was less, maybe it was more. Ben Adam Chavera, just between you and me, it's not It's not the formal halachas of the Tagre Lut. But People Rabbi, like, does that mean you have no race. recourse? You have no recourse? You have no recourse. You have no recourse. So yeah. stuff that's being sold in basements today all over the Jewish world. Yeah, yeah. They don't qualify as a marketplace. Well, again, we're, we're talking about a whole different set of, 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 of rules. And I would say, given today, it's all the global marketplace. I, I have to imagine that that um, it's very rare. You know where it might not be? You know, when you go to the backwater, even in Eretz Yisrael, I will say, you go to certain places, uh, and I don't want to identify one place less than the other, but there are certain places where, where people will still be, you know, you know, we're not we're not out there, you know, selling it on Rechov Yafo or Rechov Ben Yehuda. We're back in Rechov, I don't know, Yermia or Yaino, whatever, in the back in the back room, and we're going to sell. But the point is that he wants to make a distinction, especially in those times. And again, we have to extrapolate today. What you know, today the global marketplace is your basement. But 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 truly, um, you go to these garage sales, right? And you happen to see one, and you stop, and you see, oh, I like that item, you know. And then it's basically buyer beware. The seller isn't isn't. Yeah, they, uh, you pay. Give me six bucks for this, okay? So, and and, and it's going to wind up being oh, it should have been four or five or whatever. Or something so is. So we're going to be hard pressed to say that there was a no here because it was not done in the the in the marketplace the way the Gemara contemplates buyer and seller. That's the only thing we can say is that when it becomes as informal as yeah, you want to give me this? No, I want another fifty cents more. We're not talking about what, what is the real buying and selling, but you have to be careful. The truth of the matter is you do have to be careful because uh, things like ribbons can happen accidentally, even if you don't realize it. So if ribbons can happen that way, then maybe Ono can happen accidentally. And so uh, let's put it this way. If someone sold an item in the, in the, in the, um, in the garage sale, and it turned out that he really sold an heirloom. And then he realized that he went to Besden. I think the Besden might side with him and say that that there was Ono here, even unwittingly, and we're going to give you a break. I don't know, but it could be that the Besden will, will give him the break because, again, we're not talking about, we're talking about a big, that, who prices things for a garage sale? You don't know. My, my my schmata could be worth, uh, you know, right? What, what person goes to a pawnbroker. Pawnbrokers are sophisticated. They're the Tagre Lut of our time. But so, so they'll give you a, a price. They clearly are buying it for Stuss, for, for I know. I mean, they're not giving you anything near what it's worth. So if you're a Jewish pawnbroker and you're buying this stuff all, all day long, I don't know. Al Pihalacha, you may be violating Ono in every transaction. I mean, again, I, to be serious, if you're in that business, you have to be, have to be very, very careful. Al Pihalacha, you may be violating every time you do a, um, a do a transaction, which is an interesting concept. Um, I don't know how many you know the Jewish pawn broke, but, but but that's what people do. People uh, people buy and sell goods and you know jewelry and and all this other stuff. And the question is um, now in an auction, for instance, if you go to an auction. That's a whole different situation. An auction is not, I'm buying from you, you're buying from me. It's a different setting. 
and you have to do your homework. You have to do everything that if you don't do your homework in advance, then you, you can't come back and say, I'm, 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 I'm you know, I want to avoid the auction because you, you charged me a shush. So you can't do that. Can't do that today. So, but anyway, you see where the halacha fits in and you have to be very, very careful. Anyway, so I wanted to get that in. Mitzvah, next week, we should be able to finish to the Mishnah. And um, and again, we'll, we'll pick up uh, there. We're getting we're getting close. We're, we're getting close. Uh, we still have a way to go, but um, um, all these interesting sugyas, uh, one blends into the other. All right, so Mitzvah, we'll, we'll pick up next week.